Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Very wet June day. <laughs> the jet stream is still far to the south of the UK, so we're getting weather coming from the northwest and the north. There we are. Major junctions out of the way. <clears throat> so how are you? All right. Hope you're well. Off to work again. Don't need to take the children to school today. We'll do tomorrow and Wednesday though. The uh, general elections, uh, well, because uh, it's been, been called on an accelerated basis, uh, and it's during roughly a month. Everything's happening really fast, which I think suits the population because they don't want a, they didn't want a five month election campaign. A one month election campaign is perfectly okay as far as they're concerned. And this is the week that all the parties are going to launch their manifestos. I think it's about the soonest they've been able to get them all together, you know. So, I thought I'd uh, just launch my own manifesto. <laughs> I thought I'd give everybody the benefit of my 50 years experience in the profession as to what would restore National Health Service dentistry to everybody. Or rather, <clears throat> you know, I'd say sort of public sector dentistry. I'd like to try and keep the NHS out of it because you know, there's a big debate about what the NHS is and what it isn't and what it should be and, and what it shouldn't. So let's just talk about public versus private provision of healthcare, right? And then what, what we need to do is then sort of we go straight into the discussion about uh, what public sector provision should be, you know. Should it be that everybody's entitled to get everything in the public sector as they were when I was a young student and a young young dentist associate dentist there was practically nothing that uh, we didn't do we did bridges we did chrome dentures um, implants weren't really a thing at the time so let's just start off with a few um, basics okay there are two ways of looking at public provision. One is that, you know, you, you've got a certain amount of jam and you spread it thin by making sure that everybody can get some something on the NHS. And then the argument for that is that um, everybody, um, you've got an equality, equality of um, opportunity to get NHS treatment and also everybody pays national insurance which as we all know is a general fund and just goes into the general taxation fund and is not earmarked for the national health service at all but a lot of people still think it is they still think national insurance is for the national health service and and by god if they pay their national insurance they're entitled to treatment on the national health service so you, the first decision you have to make is that do you just try and give everybody like a very basic service or do you tell some people they're not eligible on the grounds of income mostly and that um, but everybody who is Ill elig is eligible will get a very good comprehensive service including bridges and chromes and stuff like that and my answer to that is that uh, Because money is not unlimited, you have to get to the point where you have to decide there has to be some rationing, right? And by rationing, I don't mean, uh, you know, the, you know, rationing in the sort of we're short of food or we're in the desert, we're short of water, and we've just got to eat things out of it. I mean, basically, this decisions have to be made about allocating resources. And that's because of the second rule, which is that if you're given, let's say, a million pounds to cure dental decay, 
Um, then what your aim is and should be is to allocate that million pounds to achieve the maximum possible health gain. In other words, to, to cure as much decay, tooth decay, and disease as you can for the for the million pounds. What what you do not do and cannot do, but what is commonly done, is to spend two million pounds and can go back to the commissioning authority and say, um, demand. There was so much demand. There was so much need in the community that I've overspent the budget by a factor of whatever and uh, and therefore I know I've given you a problem because you've got to find the money but you know you want to cure dental decay and that I've done it so you know you have to pay me you cannot do that and um, dentists learned that lesson very very uh, well in 1992 when in 1990 they exceeded their output targets and were rewarded with a fee cut designed to uh, claw back all the money that they'd spent in excess of what was allocated. Now, Department of Health said, look, you know, that was your budget. You should have uh, stuck to it. But because dentists really were all competing with each other to try and get, to get part of that budget, because it was fee for item at the time, um, dentists were not really uh, able to uh, judge when they had finished on on budget and not only that they also I think made the quite good argument that they had actually done the work I mean extra fillings had been done they had incurred costs materials staff wages etc and therefore um, who was going to pay for that you know and it's not fair for the Department of Health to get 120 percent productivity and only pay for 100 so let me have a sneeze and I'll get right back to you. <coughs> 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 That's alright. We'll get rid of that in post-production. So, where was I? So, so you can only um, do the amount of health that you've got the budget for. So, <clears throat> what that means is really deciding where you're going to allocate resources. Now, how do you go about saying to someone, you, you pay your national insurance, but I'm going to exclude you from the health service. You're not going to be entitled to NHS dentistry. And the answer is that's, that's a very difficult thing to do. And, um, so what happens is the government tends to try to spread the jam too thin approach and uh, make statements to the effect that NHS dentistry is available for everybody, uh, whereas in fact it's not. But but the way <clears throat> in the early sort of 10 years ago, the way that it wasn't available was that um, It was, they tried to do it through um, <clears throat> treatment rationing by cutting back on what could be done, like for ta taking orthodontic treatment out of the NHS, for example. But, but wait a minute, angry, I hear you say. Orthodontic treatment is available within the health service. Well, <clears throat> this is the crux of the argument, isn't it? It's like, it's like the old argument that anybody can stay at the Savoy. I recently had a 16-year-old girl who I wouldn't say been the subject of neglect, but her parents have divorced, and she sort of she sort of suffered a bit by neither of them really taking any responsibility for her, you know. And so, as a result, she had a lot of uh, tooth decay, and she ended up having a couple of sevens out, I think. And. Um, and so um, I asked my private orthodontist what, whether she qualified for NHS treatment and uh, you know what, what was the situation and basically she said yeah she'd, she'd easily qualify for NHS treatment because she's got missing back teeth 
She's got a, a upper right canine that's completely excluded from the arch, etc., etc. Uh, but that, uh, uh, there's a one-year waiting list for assessment. Now, that one-year waiting list for assessment, right, for somebody who's already over 16, is is a killer, isn't it? And and that's how uh, you know the Department of Health can say. The orthodontic treatment is available on the health service, you know, providing you live long enough to uh, get it done. And it also invites another type of what, health, I wouldn't call it a fraud, but I mean, I, I would call it a, you know, an insider, uh, an insider um, trick or tip which is typically used by people who are often described as having sharp elbows, which is to pay for an assessment, which then uh, puts you on the waiting list for treatment. And in this case, if she pays for an assessment, that will move her up the waiting list for treatment one year. And considering I think she needs to really start treatment pretty straight away, um, that's, that's a big deal, isn't it? But obviously her mother and her father probably don't appreciate that and I should imagine that they actually don't have the 300 quid or whatever it costs to have a private orthodontic assessment. And um, so <clears throat> this is, you know, I, 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 almost every week I'm getting a new example of how the NHS isn't working. So this idea of spreading the jam thin it, you know, and denying that there's a, there's a any shortage of NHS dentists, whereas in fact, when I qualified in Kent, there were over 500, and I know because I was a great fan of uh, mal merging, and uh, I was the BDA section secretary, and we had a list of them. All, you know, my, my nurse and I typed them all in over over a couple of days, and I think there were about 511. 512 now now as far as i know there's one in east kent uh, and, they're, and they're not really you know i mean the sort of people that are running nhs surgeries in east kent are uh, not going to win any awards for the type of dentistry they do and in fact <clears throat> <coughs> I go so far as to say they're probably one step ahead of the GDC. But, <clears throat> but there's a lot of blind eyes being turned because they don't want to say that there are no NHS dentists in East Kent. So I think that's how the system works now, you know, it's just... Uh, and you see this a lot in the NHS, you know, when things have been done wrong and, uh, or, and something bad has happened as a result, and things are not working, uh, the, the uh, ranks tighten, the ranks close. And it's very difficult for you to find out about anything like this. You know, there's a moratorium on uh, discussing it outside the closed circle of people who know how big a cock up has occurred. And the only way that you might conceivably <clears throat> find out is if you know someone or well, you've got someone in the family who's been closely involved and then they might say, for example, you know, we're going to drive past the Manston uh, refugee stroke economic migrant reception camp in a minute and uh, one thing that they're all given as soon as they're taken off the boats is um, a jolly good meal, you know, decent, decent number of, uh, a decent buffet and uh, tons of food, tons of food are thrown away at this reception camp. How do I know? Because I know someone, let's say a source close to the, <laughs> close to the story has told me that <clears throat> the food that's ordered in, if the weather is inclement as it is today and, <clears throat> and nobody arrives, it's totally wasted and it's all put in a skip <clears throat> so 
but the local press wouldn't know that. This is all sort of stuff that, you know, and as a dentist, you know that, you, you know, occasionally you do find out things. Um, Craig McKinley's our local MP, and he suffered uh, sepsis. <clears throat> and as a result of the sepsis, um, he lost his hands and his feet, which is, is a tragedy, you know. I mean, as he says, to lose your feet is, is like inconvenient, but to lose your hands is a real problem. Anyway, he was unlucky in a way, <laughs> unlucky in a way, because he was taken to St. Thomas, and St. Thomas is a massive, great state of the art of the hospital, uh, and guess where it is? Yes, it's, it's exactly the other side of the river to the House of Commons. And I'm sure it's no uh, coincidence that a state-of-the-art, very highly funded, very prestigious, probably the most prestigious hospital in London, is literally a walk across a bridge from the House of Commons. Because anybody that has any problem, anything goes wrong with them in the House of Commons, they're in St Thomas's, straight away. And that was uh, McKinley's journey, he was Basically, the ambulance people were reluctant to admit him, but I, I believe his wife insisted that he was admitted. Uh, I think she's a pharmacist or something similar. And then he went into QEQM where he laid around for a bit while people wondered what he was doing there and, you know, didn't know he was the MP and um, nothing happened. And then, and then obviously, eventually, when uh, it was diagnosed, it was then decided that the hospital that, that would treat me, that, that I would be, was not good enough for Mr. McKinley. He had to go to St. Thomas. So, anyway, we still haven't got onto dentistry, but we can do because it's quite easy, you know, I'm gonna eventually get there so what have we learned so far right you can you've got to say to people I'm sorry you're too wealthy to go on the NHS and they will say which they always say but I pay my national insurance and the other you say yes and that is for people as what I call the uh, there but for the grace of God type argument which is that there by there but for the grace of God goes goes you you're lucky you don't need it but it's there for you if you do so don't say you can't use it because if you were ever poor enough and destitute enough to need it then you could use it and people would have to swallow that because that's the only way you're going to have a, a decent uh, you know so you have to stick within budget and you have to work on the basis that some people are excluded on the basis of uh, the greater need of others. Now, the other thing, of course, is that uh, in 1992, there was a fundamental change, and uh, which, and it was summarised best, but I was at a meeting at the time, and there was a representative there from the Department of Health and uh, there, there'd been this big uh, hoo-ha in 1990 exceeded output targets 1992 a fee cut because we'd all worked too hard and uh, culminated in the 2006 the Cockroft contract the Cockroft cock-up and uh, this Department of Health guy was completely completely anonymous but obviously uh, quite quite involved with policy making at the Department of Health I was talking to him and he said something which I'll I'll always remember he said I think the dentists have been in charge and, and in the in the steering in the in the driving seat for too long with dentistry I think we need to change that and that and he more or less said that the reason why things were going so badly is because dentists were 
basically in charge of and responsible for um, providing the service as self-employed subcontractors, which is what they were. So what happened was in 2006, effectively dentists were nationalised. They were then they were left with the responsibility of paying the staff and buying the premises and paying for the materials and making sure there was enough left over at the end of the day for them to um, pay themselves. But um, <clears throat> but the Department of Health took over uh, what treatments they could do, how many treatments they could do, who they could work on. Uh, what materials they could use, etc., 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 and so it was a sort of a nationalisation by stealth. I'm totally acquiesced to by the BDA. You know, always weak, always weak negotiators, always full of uh, academics who really had no skin in the game in terms of um, in terms of uh, you know general practice. The academic. Uh, tail always wag, wag, wag the um, general practice dog in the BDA and um, so we we lost the um, dentist really lost control or NHS dentists lost control of their own dentists private dentists didn't because and a lot of dentists went private in 92 um, and uh, and and you know and that, and obviously that was like that's 30 years ago so you can imagine how many I mean even if two percent of the workforce or three percent of the workforce goes goes private every year over 30 years then that's how you get to where we are today so my recommendation really and it won't happen because uh, you know the policy of the Department of Health has pretty well been captured, you know, by there's this useless feedback system where uh, the select committee, if it meets, it was going to meet recently, a couple of years ago, and then it decided not to meet, and it doesn't matter whether it meets or not, because it only calls witnesses to feed it a point of view that it wants to arrive at, as Ken Weech said, never hold an inquiry unless you know the result in advance, and uh, and so people like me used to get called and now now don't get called uh, because we are we're thinking we're thinking outside the box you know in terms of policy now my policy will be to go back to uh, status quo ante which is basically when I qualified everybody had an NHS dentist the quality of the work was was generally very good there was a very robust inspection and testing and compliance system costs were low we didn't have to put up with um, having to register x-rays with local authorities or the care quality commission or uh, pay 400 pounds every three months to get the steriliser certified etc etc but the department of health has several principles they one principle is that they never go back to a system that existed before because that would more or less imply that when they changed it, they, they'd made a mistake. And the other thing they will never do is um, they will never countenance anything that was uh, thought of first by someone else. So when we've got things like the, the voucher system or granted aid or something, which will, which will eventually be adopted because you know, it will, I mean, it's, uh, you know, these things are it's like nuclear power, you know, 30 years it's been the prior, now all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, but nuclear power looks good, you know. Um, people are very slow at coming to the correct decision, but they do eventually. They won't in my lifetime, but they will eventually. And, um, and we can go back to having a, a system that's run by the dentists that rewards productivity that uh, uh, provides a high quality treatment um, at prices that people can afford to the entire population. Just wind the clock back. Wind the clock back 40 years. Because 
And the problem is that <clears throat> everybody thinks that people from the olden days, like the 1900s, they were stupid. They were unintelligent people, hairy people, low foreheads, and uh, that we are so much more sophisticated these days. But in fact, we're not. The reverse is the truth. Our, our parents and grandparents were extremely clever. They had to be uh, because of the environment they lived in. They had two world wars. They had, uh, you know, a lot, none of the luxuries that we had. They had, um, hello, my lovely nurse. Uh, they had, um, they were very resourceful, but mostly they, they were well educated for the most part and they understood uh, how things worked and, and understood how to make things work. Now, uh, <clears throat> by comparison now, we've got a bunch of people in, in charge who are really are very poorly educated are very, very uh, bad models of how the world works and um, uh, are, and it's not a meritocracy, not in terms of uh, um, brain power. So, so really what we've done is we've gone back. We need to look at these solutions that were adopted after the war because the old pay-as-you-go pay system was very easy, very simple to operate. Uh, had good, robust uh, quality controls, and um, and operated from <clears throat> operated from 1948 to about 1990. So that's that's 42 years without any trouble at all, without any trouble at all. <clears throat> and there are there are other there are there were good things about it as well that I won't go into, like you know how it managed to keep costs down and stuff like that. But no, no, these idiots at the Department of Health know better. And uh, they think they know better, and, and the, the whole system's collapsed, and they still think they know better. So you can expect more of the same, whichever party wins. All right, lovely. That's my uh, morning unload. I shall talk to you later. Bye.